Welcome back to St. Thomas Aquinas. For everyone, I'm Dave Palmer, and we now are getting into the specific sacraments. And it's interesting because we're coming to the end of the Summa, and it's been a long road. I hope you've seen all the videos. If not, go back and watch all the other ones because the sacraments don't really make sense unless you understand the rest of the Summa, starting off with the very first article, which said, that besides natural philosophy, do we need some kind of additional doctrine, something else? And Thomas said, yes, because our end is supernatural. Heaven is supernatural. God is supernatural. And we are not. And so in order for us to achieve our end, we need help. And so throughout the whole Summa, we learned about the theological virtues that unite us directly to God, that God is their object, right? We learned about how even from a natural level to be a good person through the acquired virtues. We learned about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which elevate us supernaturally. And so the whole thing is building up to this crescendo where we're either going to achieve our goal, which Thomas has talked about throughout the whole Summa, which is coming to know God, being with God, the, the vision of the divine essence, or we're not. How are we going to do that? Well, God has to lift us above our nature, and he does that through grace. <clears throat> if you remember at the very end of Prima Secunda, we talked about grace. It's a quality of the soul, you know, what all the different types of grace. So now we get into the ordinary ways in which we receive grace. And looking at it from a purely you know, non-spiritual sense, it doesn't seem to make sense that you put water on somebody and say some words and they are regenerated and something actually happens. But that's what our faith tells us. And so we're going to be talking about five or six articles from the Summa about baptism. There's a whole lot more than that, but I had to pick the ones that I thought were most important. And so let's get right into it. And Go to our PowerPoint where we're talking about the sacrament of baptism. And again, we have to start with matter and form because that is what the sacraments all have. They have a matter and they have a form. And so whether water is the proper matter of baptism, of course, you look at all these pictures and you see that, needless to say, water plays a very, very important part of our life, you know, from recreation to putting out fires to the ocean, sustaining life. I mean, water is everywhere. And that's actually one of the things that Thomas is going to point out here is that because of how ubiquitous it is, that's why really the most necessary of the sacraments is based on water being the matter. And so Thomas says, by divine institution, water is a proper matter of baptism and with reason, first, by reason of the very nature of baptism, which is a regeneration into spiritual life. And this answers to the nature of water in a special degree, wherefore seeds from which all living things, plants and animals are generated, are, mo are moist and akin to water. For this reason, certain philosophers held that water is the first principle of all things. Secondly, in regard to the effects of baptism to which the properties of water correspond, for by reason of its moistness, it cleanses, and hence it fittingly signi signifies and causes the cleansing from sins. Thirdly, because it is suitable for the signification of the mysteries of Christ, by which we are justified. For as Christendom, Christendom says, unless a man be born again, uh, when we dip our heads under the water as in a kind of tomb, our old man is buried, and being submerged is hidden below, and thence he rises again renewed. Fourthly, because by being so universal and abundant, it is a matter suitable to our need of the sacrament, for it can be easily be obtained everywhere. And so he's saying here that if it's that important and it's necessary, as we're going to talk about in a moment, well, it's got to be something that is everywhere easily obtained, and that's what water is. And so Again, seems hard to believe, seems too good to be true that simply putting water on somebody and giving the Trinitarian formula, that's regeneration, but that is what our faith tells us. And so let's move on to the next thing is what is the proper form of baptism? 
And we know, you probably know, that a person who baptizes somebody has to say, I believe, I baptize thee in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Okay, it receives its consecration from its form. Consequently, the cause of baptism needs to be expressed in the baptismal form. Now, this cause is twofold, the principal cause from which it derives its virtue, and this is the Blessed Trinity, and the instrumental cause, that is, the minister who confers the sacrament outward, outwardly, wherefore both causes should be expressed in the form of baptism. Now, the minister is, is, is designated by the words, I baptize thee, and the principal cause, in the words, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Therefore, this is the suitable form of baptism. I baptize thee in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Okay, and the church is pretty much uh, a stickler on that. You got to say that. You can't say the name of the Creator and the Redeemer and the Sanctifier. You have to use those exact words. I think you can say Holy Spirit instead of Holy Ghost, but you can't say we baptize you. You have to say I baptize you. And since it's so important that people be baptized, you got to make sure you get it right. Okay, can a, can a layman baptize? This is really interesting because a lot of times we hear what is the ordinary and what is the extraordinary, kind of like the ordinary liturgy of the Mass and the extraordinary liturgy. So now we're talking about can a layman baptize? And, of course, typically you have a priest or a deacon, but under some circumstances, in like fear of death, anybody can baptize. That's what Thomas is going to say. It is due to the mercy of him who will have all men to be saved, that in those things which are necessary for salvation, man can easily find the remedy. Now, the most necessary among all the sacraments is baptism, which is man's regeneration into spiritual life. Since for children there is no substitute, while adults cannot otherwise than by baptism receive a full remission both of guilt and of punishment. Consequently, lest man should have to go without so necessary a remedy, it was ordained both that the matter of baptism should be something common that is easily obtainable by all water and that the minister of baptism should be anyone, even not in orders, lest from lack of being baptized, man should suffer the loss of his salvation. All right. So I think it makes a lot of sense that if we have to be baptized, it would be something that's common, like water, and also anybody can do it under an emergency. Now, typically, we want a priest or a deacon to do it, but we can do it. And so if somebody was dying in front of you and they weren't baptized, you'd be doing them the greatest favor they ever received by baptizing them. Okay, can a man be saved without baptism? That's the next question here, and we will see what Thomas has to say. <clears throat> All right, there's a bunch of people. All right. <laughs> Uh, the sacrament of baptism may be wanting to someone in two ways. First, both in reality and in desire, as in the case when with those who neither are baptized nor wish to be baptized, which clearly indicates contempt for the sacrament in regard to those who have the use of the free will. Consequently, those whom baptism is wanting thus cannot obtain salvation, since neither sacramentally nor mentally are they incorporated in Christ through whom alone salvation can be obtained. Secondly, the sacrament of baptism may be wanting to anyone in reality, but not in desire. For instance, when a man wishes to be baptized, but by some ill chance he is forestalled by death before receiving baptism, and such a man can obtain salvation without being actually baptized on account of his desire for baptism. Which desire is the outcome of faith that worketh by charity, whereby God, whose power is not tied to visible sacraments, sanctifies man inwardly, hence Ambrose says of Valentinian, who died while yet a catechumen, I lost him whom I was to regenerate, but he did not lose the grace he prayed for. All right, so, you know, sometimes you think that in the modern church we've kind of relaxed the rules and it's not necessary that you actually get baptized and there's baptism of desire and baptism of blood. But you can see even in the 13th century with Aquinas, that was still the case that if somebody desired baptism, that that was efficacious and that was enough. Okay, only God is the one who grants salvation, but this is what the church teaches. All right, so let's move on. We've got a couple more uh, articles to talk about. And big issue among Catholics and Protestants, should children be baptized? And if so, why? There's some pictures, uh, <laughs> of those cute pictures, cute pictures of children being baptized, Looks like it might be the same baby. 
and then an adult being baptized as well. And Thomas says, children contract original sin from the sin of Adam, which is made clear by the fact that they are under the ban of death, which passed upon all on account of the sin of the first man. Much more, therefore, can children receive grace through Christ so as to reign in eternal life. But our Lord himself said, unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Consequently, it became necessary to baptize children that is, in birth, they incurred damnation through Adam, so in the second birth, they might obtain salvation through Christ. Moreover, it was fitting that children should receive baptism in order that, being reared from childhood in things pertaining to the Christian mode of life, they may the more easily persevere therein, according to Proverbs, a young man according to his way, even when he is old, he will not depart from it. All right, so let's just discuss this for a second. You know, when children are born, we start taking care of them in temporal ways right away. We teach them a language. We protect them, put clothes on them. We educate them as soon as we can, right? As soon as they start to learn how to talk, we don't delay until they they wait. And so if the most important thing you can give a child is baptism, why wait? Because as Thomas said a moment ago, the, the the curse of Adam is on them. You know, we believe that in faith, right? So let's move on to the next question, whether man is freed from baptism from all debt of punishment due to sin. Okay, so what happens when the cause being baptism, the effect, what happens to us? What What is the effect of baptism? By baptism, a man, a man is incorporated in the passion and death of Christ, according to Romans 6, 8. If we be dead in Christ, we believe that we shall also together with Christ, be together with Christ. Hence it is clear that the passion of Christ is communicated to every baptized person so that he is healed just as if he himself had suffered and died. Now Christ's passion is a su- sufficient satisfaction for all the sins of all men. Consequently, he who is baptized is free from the debt of all punishment due to him for his sins just as he himself had offered sufficient satisfaction for all of his sins. Okay, so that is going to do it. And it's funny because God's making it pretty easy on us. You know, we don't really have to do very much to, you know, obliterate the sin of Adam, original sin, all the temporal punishment of sin, at least at the time that you get baptism. And it almost seems too good to be true that that's all we got to do. Anybody can do it. It's water. It's a formula. It's I baptize thee in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and all that happens. We don't see anything. We don't feel any different. Okay, but this is what's so cool about our faith is that we're told these things happen, and we trust that God established a church, and this is passed down through the Catholic Church. And, of course, anybody can baptize, even in other religions, right? And so that's baptism. All right, we're going to go through each of the each of the sacraments. Next will be confirmation, then Eucharist, and then we'll do uh, marriage and holy orders and extreme unction or anointing of the sick. These are the ways that we receive grace. This is sanctifying grace. This is what justifies us. This is what unites us to God. Okay, this is important. And so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, thank you for watching, and be sure to comment or ask questions, like subscribe and all that kind of stuff and thank you very much for watching god bless you